I'm sorry, I'm not used to being the one who has to get up here first. I was looking at pictures of Niagara Falls. I've never been before. It looked like they were fixing to go over the falls on the pictures. Um, we welcome everyone here today. Obviously, Mr. D and Miss Carolyn are out of town this weekend. Um, so, uh, but don't worry, you don't have to listen to me preach today. We have a guest with us, Reverend Frank Grubbs, a good friend of Mr. D's, um, is a former pastor of Selma, most recent pastor. Um, and how many churches have you pastored? Because you didn't stay in one place for 40 some years like D, right? <laughs> Um, but uh, we are happy to have him and his wife and daughter with him today, um, and so he will be bringing the message to us a little bit later in the service. Um, do want to welcome everyone here today. Be sure to look at your bulletin for the announcements. Um, remember, ladies, uh, Trinity Circle meets at 6.30 Monday night, and then Woman's Auxiliary is at 7. Deacons also meet at 7, um, and then... Tuesday night, it's not listed in the bulletin, but the Christian Education Board moved our meeting from last week to this week, so the Christian Education Board meets at 6.30 on Tuesday, and then Wednesday, all of our stuff starts back with Summer Adventures at 8 o'clock, um, and then um, our supper is at 5.30, and it should say Youth Activities at 6.30, and then, of course, the Adult Bible Study at 6.30 and Chancel Choir Practice at 7.30. And then Saturday, 7.30, men's prayer breakfast at Wayne Evans. Um, since we're renovating Heritage Hall, be sure you take a look. They've made a lot of progress. Um, be sure, parents, if you haven't got your summer adventures uh, registration paid, um, it's $5 if you pay by today. It's $10 if you pay tomorrow or later. Um, and those who have already pre-registered, I have only a few more spots, so if you haven't pre-registered, be sure to get that to me today. Um, the other announcements are in the bulletin for you to see. We're collecting um, items for the uh, children's home still, and they are being collected here in this hallway as well as the CEC, and we need them no later than Wednesday night, July 18th, so that we can take them with us to the Mudcats game. I have not ordered the Mudcats tickets yet, so if anyone wants to go to the Mudcats game, get me your $6 and let me know that you're going, and that is on um, Friday, July 20th. Be sure to look at the information about the Youth Sunday um, as well as all the Wednesday night information and Summer Adventures information. If no one has any other announcements, let us prepare our hearts for worship. Please stand and join us in the responsive call to worship that's in your bulletin. <coughs> Our Lord wills us to stay in the faith, for we are both by his good work and his goodness to remain in the faith. Knowing his goodness, he wants us always to trust firmly in his blessed promise. By whatever means he teaches us, his will is that we perceive him wisely, receive him joyfully, and keep ourselves to him faithfully. Mr. Jerry Godwin, will you lead us in our invocation? Lord, we pray that we have love in our hearts, and Lord, certainly we 
take your hymnal and turn to hymn number 271, Standing on the Promises. to greet those around you and if you don't know someone around you be sure to introduce yourself Our Old Testament lesson this morning comes from Ezekiel chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. Ezekiel 2, 1 through 5. He said to me, Son of man, stand upon your feet, and I will speak to you. As he spoke, the Spirit came into me and raised me to my feet, and I heard him speaking to me. He said, Son of man, I am sending you to the Israelites, to a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me. They and their fathers have been in revolt against me to this very day. The people to whom I am sending you are obstinate and stubborn. Say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says, and whether they listen or fail to listen, for they are a rebellious house, they will know that a prophet has been among them. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We do have a card here. says, to the church, I would like to thank everyone for the cards and prayers and phone calls. It really helped me very much. Keep me in your prayers. Thank you, Connie Johnson. And we are glad to have Connie back with us today. Um, are there any names that need to be added to the prayer list that we have in the bulletin insert today?
um, please be sure to look at the prayer um, list that is in the bulletin and keep all of those people in your prayers um, and keep our volunteers as well as our children in your prayers as we start the summer adventures program this week let us pray most gracious and loving God we thank you for this your day that you have made we thank you for all of the blessings that you have given to us although we are so unworthy of your love and your grace and your mercy Lord we do lift up those names that are on our printed prayer list as well as unspoken prayer requests and burdens that we have on our hearts Lord you know each and every situation better than we know them ourselves Lord for we know that you have counted the hairs on our heads that is how intimate you know each and every one of us Lord we ask that you grant comfort and peace and healing forgiveness mercy and strength to each person as they need it. Lord, we pray for our nation, for our leaders, for those who are serving our nation in times of war, in areas of war. We pray for our denomination and its leaders and its ministries, and our church, Lord, and all the different ways that we are trying to reach out to our community Lord open our eyes and hearts so that we may better know how you would have us to be the light of the world in our community these things we pray Thank you. 
the Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthians in chapter 2, verse 9, starting with verse 6. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each one should give what they have decided in their heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Consider all the blessings that God has given to you as you decide what to give back to God. It belongs to God anyways. Our ushers come forward to receive our tithes and offerings.
gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've given us. Thank you for this time that we can gather in your house, dear Lord. We ask you, dear God, just to take these offerings and tithes to, to continue building your kingdom on this earth. It's all these things we pray. Amen. And at this time, I will ask Brother Frank to come up. And he will take over the service from here. And the kids who normally go with me to Junior's Church may go with me to Junior Church. I know y'all are hot, but uh, as long as you don't start disrobing, we'll be okay. <laughs> uh, good to be here. I'm glad to have the invitation and the opportunity to uh, fill in for D in his absence. Um, there's a couple of uh, things I noticed, though, or my daughter and wife noticed in the bulletin. Uh, June was not. Anna's birthday that just happened to be the month she got her license and Dee assumed that since uh, she got her license in June that that was also her birthday. Uh, her birthday was back in February and it took from February to June for her mother to have the courage to allow her to get her <laughs> license. So, um, uh, <laughs> and I have started uh, uh, the chapter of, of Dad in Smithfield, um, and some of you might want to join uh, Dads Against Daughters Dating. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, uh, our gospel lesson today is from Mark uh, chapter 6, reading verses uh, 1 through 13. Jesus left and returned to his hometown with his disciples. The next Sabbath, he taught in the Jewish meeting place. Many of the people who heard him were amazed, and they asked, how can he do all this? Where did he get such wisdom and the power to work these miracles? Isn't he the carpenter, the son of Mary? Aren't James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon his brothers? Don't his sisters still have, still live here in our town? The people were very unhappy because of what he was doing. But Jesus said, Prophets are honored by everyone except the people of their hometown and their relatives and their own family. Jesus could not work any miracles there except to heal a few sick people by placing his hands on them. He was surprised that the people did not have any faith. Jesus taught in all the neighboring villages. Then he called together his 12 disciples and sent them out two by two with power over evil spirits. He told them, you may take along a walking stick, but don't carry food or a traveling bag or any money. It's all right to wear sandals, but don't take along a change of clothes. When you are welcomed into a home, stay there until you leave that town. If any place won't welcome you or listen to your message, leave and shake the dust from your feet as a warning to them. The apostles left and started telling everyone to turn to God. They forced out many demons and healed a lot of sick people by putting olive oil on them. This is the word of the Lord for the people of God. I was called into the ministry at uh, an early age, but I refused to listen. I guess it was about at uh, age uh, 16, about Anna's age now, that uh, I knew 
that I was called into the ministry. I was at Cragmont. I was in the old tabernacle that had a sawdust floor at the time when I knew that the Lord was moving in my life in that direction. I proceeded to go about my life as usual, knowing that I had been called. <coughs> I graduated from high school and was headed to NC State to fulfill my heart's desire. That was to become a forest ranger or to work in the field of wildlife in some way. And it was there that I finally gave in and I said, okay. I dropped out of school, went to work, uh, earned some money, and then entered Mount Olive College to begin my preparation for the ministry. But the Lord gave me a promise, and I think he has fulfilled that promise. He has brought me full circle. I'm no longer pastoring, even though I am still an ordained minister, and my options are never closed. But I'm now working at uh, Howe Woods Environmental Learning Center, doing what uh, I originally set out to do. And I believe that the Lord had a hand in it. And I say that my options are not closed because I always want to be open to God's leading. Uh, someone, it might have been D, who asked me, was I going back into the active pastorate? And I said, well, if a church makes an offer I can't refuse, I guess I will. Uh, so far, no one has made that offer, but I really do preface that with, with this. I will be back in the active pastorate as soon as I know that that's where the Lord wants me to be. And I tell that story to let you know that, uh, you know, in these, as, my, as I get older, I realize that the Lord has many plans and we don't understand at the time but he also make his, makes promises and he fulfills those promises if we will be faithful today's gospel opens with jesus going to his hometown where he speaks in the synagogue and there back home jesus is not well received you would think that it would be the opposite of that, but the hometown folks see Jesus as a carpenter, remembering his humble beginnings, knowing that he got training by Joseph. And so Jesus leaves his hometown and ventures forth to spread the good news. And it is there, out in the surrounding villages, as Jesus leaves his hometown, as he abandons his family and friends, that Jesus calls his disciples together, telling them that they also must relinquish, abandon, let go, and move forward with him. I'm really going to talk to you this morning about a doctrine that you won't find in our statement of faith and discipline. And it's the doctrine of relinquishment, of letting go, of giving up, and letting God have his way. How different, though, this is from the way we usually present the Christian life or the way that our society bombards us with such a different attitude. We usually present Jesus as a means of getting something that we need. And yet here Jesus is, presenting, is presented as the master of relinquishment. 
come and follow Jesus and leave things behind, give up things that were once dear to you, and move forward with Jesus. Jesus sends his disciples out to do the same things that he has been doing. Preaching, healing. He signs, the, be the signs of the coming kingdom of God is what he is telling them. Come and follow Jesus and leave those cares behind Leave those things that mattered to you and put your complete trust in God. And before he sends them out, he gives them some instructions, telling them what not to carry with them. A few weeks ago, I was participating in a Boy Scout campery that was being held at Howell Woods. And I was the counselor for the Reptile and Amphibian Study Merit Badge. Now, there was over 200 Boy Scouts at that event. And we counselors had no idea how many would be in our particular group and had to teach the session twice, you know, once in the morning and do the same thing in the afternoon with a new group. I studied. I knew what the requirements were for those boys to pass that merit badge. And I was ready for an enthusiastic group of scouts. I even took Anna along to be my helper because I knew that that would get their attention. And as I began, I soon realized that only a few of those boys were actually ready for what was about to be thrust upon them. And so I asked them, I said, has the scout motto been changed over the years and I never got the memo? You know, the scout motto is be prepared. You don't have the requirements before you. You don't have the merit badge book before you. How are we going to proceed? And some of the boys did go on the internet. They pulled down, and all of them were told to do this, but only a few actually did it. And they came with the handout. They had even studied the merit badge uh, book. And I, I, I guess I'm ashamed to say this, but in my adult life, I've taken that motto that the scouts instilled in me when I was young to uh, another level in my adult life. You know, the new motto, it's better to have it and not need it than to need it and not have it. And so any time that I travel, whether it's to the minister's conference or on vacation or, evening, or even when I go camping, I always have more than I need. Last time, well, we recently went on vacation, I wore about half the clothes that I could. But I'm thinking that Jesus is talking about something deeper here. There is something about Jesus and his mission that necessitates his instruction. Take no purse, no bag, or sandals. Don't even take a change of clothes with you. On his first day of class, Will Willeman, who taught at Duke Divinity School for a number of years as the dean of the chapel, would often begin by asking his new students this question. Tell me how you got to seminary. A woman responded to him one time. She said, I was a research chemist. 
I was a research chemist. I had my own lab. And then God called me. Midlife, he called me into the ministry. My kids threw a fit. My husband walked out on us just two weeks after I shared this with them. I have had to move here, leave the town and the house that I love, but I really hope that I am following Jesus and doing what he wants me to do. And I read that and I thought, wow. That was even a greater sacrifice than I even considered when I went into the ministry. You see, there seems to be something about Jesus that makes him require relinquishment like that. A church I know launched out into a big capital campaign. You know what that's like. And the chair of the committee was a 34-year-old father of three. And after the successful campaign, I asked the pastor to what did he ascribe such success. And here's what he said. The day that Tom stood up and testified to the congregation that he and his young wife had prayerfully decided to give 20% of their income to the church and its work, well, there was no defense for that. Sometimes Christians underestimate what a radical challenge they are to the world of their theology of relinquishment. In a very success-oriented, get-all-you-can society, for a young man or a young woman to stand up and testify to the ability to let go, to launch out, to give up, well, it's downright subversive. That's why it took me so many years to finally give in and say, okay, Lord, if this is what you want me to do, I'll do it. So Jesus sends out his disciples as if he was sending them into war. They are going into battle. And when you go into battle, you don't take anything except the bare necessities. Out there, without the props that most people require in our society, you know, like power and economic success, driving the right car, an impressive career, Successful children, and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We could go on and continue to name those things. The disciples become a sort of test for the power of Jesus. Can Jesus Christ accomplish what he promised? In my earlier years as a pastor, members came to me to help them think through some problem in their life. And as they entered my office, they would see the diplomas and the certificates on the wall. In fact, when I set up my office, I intentionally set them on the wall so that when you came in the door, that was one of the first things you saw. These are my credentials. This is what backs me up. And I had hoped that anyone who came into my office would indeed be impressed. But no. They were coming to me to help them put their life in the context of God's will. 
of God's providence. What they most needed was not my good academic training or the credentials and the certificates. They need God. I mean, those things are important in preparation. But that's where it stops. It's good for preparation. A dear friend of mine who is now deceased would not allow us to call him doctor. And he deserved it more than anyone I'd ever met. Some of you may know him. I'm sure that Dee has mentioned him because he was a good friend of both of us, Dr. Vernon Wall. And that doctor, though, that credentials was in preparation for what he was going to do. Sometimes all my baggage, the certificates and the diplomas, and that not so nicely appointed office that I occupy would actually distract us from the main business at hand. That is to seek out God for this particular situation. I finally quit meeting people in my office. I finally grew up and learned something. I would always meet them in the adjoining uh, conference room. I was at a conference recently, a while back, and part of it dealt with what I felt to be my calling in the ministry, the small membership church. Most of our churches in the Free Will Baptist denomination fit that category. But there was a church consultant was helping us think through some of the challenges of serving a small membership struggling congregation. But when he said something on into the uh, presentation was when I became impressed. The small membership church can be a challenge, he said, but it also has a way of keeping focused on the main thing of the church, the worship and the service of the living Christ. Everything that we do should come out of our worship of God. He went on to say, if you want to worry about churches, worry about the congregation that, get, that can get so, so, get so caught up in Zumba classes and trips for the youth and 12-step groups that the church can lose its soul. Someone was commenting this morning, they were actually bragging about... Uh, your new educational facility and how the debate went of whether to, what to build and how to build. And the conclusion was that you built exactly what you needed. I don't know why churches build gyms. There's a lot of things I don't know that are going on out there. But what we need is to focus our attention on God as the supreme source of our existence. As a pastor, there were days when I got distracted. I got deluded into thinking that my job was to run a well-functioning volunteer organization or a community service center. But no. I often had to remind myself that the main thing that I need to look in the mirror each morning and say to myself, let go of the baggage. Stay focused on the most important thing. You are a pastor. You are to bring people into a meaningful relationship to God. 
The other day I was talking to a woman who was excited about a new ministry that had started in her church and how the program was just beginning to grow and bloom. And I asked her what the key to that ministry's growth was. She gave an interesting response. She said, I think we really started to have success when we stopped trying to succeed. We had feared that we might fail. We were trying too hard to be successful where we were. And we made amazing discovery that God did not call us to be successful. He called us to be faithful. And when we let go of our fear and our need to succeed, then God started helping us to succeed. Do you know what she's talking about? I think you do. Sometimes you have to let go of inappropriate, constricting baggage in order to move forward with Christ. A friend of mine recently became pastor of a distinguished older church in our denomination. And I asked him how the move was going. And he replied to the effect, right now I spend most of my time listening to their history. They all need to tell me the mistakes that my predecessor had made. All the trouble they had 10 years ago. And on and on it goes. And he said, that's okay and it's understandable. It's important for me to know their history. My great fear is that they are not going to be able to let go of their sad history. They're going to continue to carry it with them into the future, so much so that it's going to kill them. Discipleship was and always will be costly. As Dietrich Bonhoeffer said in words that has basically become virtual scripture in any conversation about discipleship, cheap grace is preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance, baptism without church discipline, communion without confession, absolution without personal confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, grace without Jesus Christ living and incarnate. Costly grace is the gospel which must be sought again and again. The gift which must be asked for. The door at which one must knock. Such grace is costly because it calls us to follow Jesus Christ. It is costly because it costs us our lives. It is grace because it gives us the only true life. Giving up self and following Jesus is the most courageous thing that a person can do, but it's also the best thing that a person can do. Jesus is on the move, and he's calling us to move with him. question before us 
will we be obedient to his command to take nothing with us except his vocation and his providential care? Will we share the love of Christ in our daily lives? Let us pray. Lord, you have indeed called us into your service. You have enlisted us in your work. Grant us, we pray, that having called us and enlisted us, you will also give us the gifts and graces we need to serve you. And in serving you, to enjoy you. Enable us, through your grace, to acquire those skills and insights that we need to fulfill your will and also to let go of our own. To give up and relinquish every desire, every trait, and every tendency that weighs us down or hinders our faithful work for you. This we pray in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen. Take your hymn book and turn to page 249. We're changing um, our invitation. I don't know 248, so, <laughs> so please stand. Let's be dismissed in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this beautiful day you've given us, Lord. Thank you for bringing us back on the way to this uh, special day. We ask, Lord, that you will give our pastor and his wife some rest and relaxation this weekend, Lord, and bring them back safely. 
Ask now that you go with us and be with us.